1023 AC is remembered as the year of the Fourth Dornish War, better known amongst the small folk of Westeros as Prince Morian's Madness, or the War of a Hundred Candles. The old Prince of Dawn had died, and his son, Morian Mattel, had succeeded him in Sunspear. The new prince was rash and a foolish young man, who had long bristled at his father's cowardice during Lord Rogar Baratheon's war when the Lord of Storm's End led knights of the Seven Kingdoms into the Red Mountains, allowing them to march through their lands with impunity, leaving them unmolested. Whilst the Dornish armies stayed at home and left the Vulture King, the leader of a group of outlaws, frequently attacking Westeros, deep into the marshes, to his fate. With the old Prince of Dawn leaving the popular outlaw to his fate, many in Dawn began to see House Martell as weak, and nothing but the lapdogs of the dragon lords of House Targaryen. Prince Morian also felt this way and was determined to avenge this stain on Dornish honour. The prince planned his own invasion of the Seven Kingdoms. It was a popular idea and reignited the fire within the Dornish lords to stand up to the might of House Targaryen, like they had when Aegon conquered the rest of Westeros. Though he knew well, Dawn could not hope to prevail against the might that the Iron Throne could muster against him in a conventional war. Prince Morian thought that he might take King Jaehaerys Targaryen unawares and conquer the Stormlands as far south as Storm's End, or at the very least Cape Wrath deeper into the Seven Kingdoms than any Dornish ruler had attacked and held for hundreds of years. Rather than attack by way of the Prince's Pass, the only real way to move a large army through the Red Mountains, Prince Morian planned to come by sea. He would assemble his host at Ghost Hill and the Tor, load them onto ships, and sell them across the Sea of Dawn to take the Stormlanders by surprise, as he believed the spies and scouts of the Iron Throne would have their focus on the Prince's Pass. If he was defeated or driven back, so be it. But before he went, he swore to burn a hundred towns and raise a hundred castles, so the Stormlanders might know they could never again march into the Red Mountains with impunity. The madness of this plan can be seen in the fact that there are neither a hundred towns nor a hundred castles on Cape Wrath, nor even a third of that number. Dawn had not boasted any strength at sea since Nymeria burned her ten thousand ships, but Prince Morian did have gold, and he found winning allies in the pirates of the Stepstones, the Salsals of Mere, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast. Though it took him the best part of a year, eventually the ships came straggling in, and the prince and his spearmen were loaded aboard. Morian had been weaned on the tales of past Dornish glory. Like many young Dornish lords, he had seen the sun-motted bones of the dragon Meraxis at Hellholt, where Queen Rhaenys Targaryen, the beloved wife and sister of Aegon the Conqueror, and her dragon was shot down and killed during the First Dornish War. Every ship in his fleet was therefore manned with crossbowmen and equipped with massive scorpions of the sort that had failed Meraxis. If the Targaryens dared to send dragons against him, he would fill the air with bolts and kill them all. Not an awful plan, but by far as sound as the prince had thought. In truth, the folly of Prince Morian's plans could not be overstated despite the sound concept. His hope of taking the Iron Throne unaware was laughable. Not only did Jaehaerys have spies in Morian's own court, he had friends amongst the shrewder Dornish lords. But the pirates of the Stepstones, the South Sals of Mere, and the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast are none of them famed for their discretion. You cannot hide that many ships, and an army that size, for long. The sheer amount of time it took everyone to muster. A few coins changing hands was all it took. By the time Morian set sail, the king had known of his attack for half a year. Borman Baratheon, the Lord of Storm's End had been made well aware as well, and was waiting on Cape Wrath to give the Dornishmen a red welcome. When they came ashore, he would never have that chance. Jaehaerys Targaryen and his two eldest sons, Aemon and Balon, had been waiting as well, and as Morian's fleet beat its way across the Sea of Dawn, the dragons, Vermithor, Caraxes and Vagar, fell on them out of the clouds. Shouts rang out, and the Dornish filled the air with scorpion bolts. But firing at a dragon is one thing, and killing it is quite another. A few bolts glanced at the scales of the dragon, and one punched through Vagar's wing, but none of them found any vulnerable spots, as the dragon swooped and banked, and loosed great blasts of fire. One by one, the ships went up in gouts of flame. They were still burning when the sun went down, like a hundred candles floating on the sea. Burned bodies would wash up on the shores of Cape Wrath for half a year, and not a single living Dornishman set a foot upon the Stormlands. The Fourth Dornish War was fought and won in a single day. The pirates of the Stepstones, the Salsals of Mere, the Corsairs of the Pepper Coast, became less troublesome for the Iron Throne for some time, and Mira Martel became the Princess of Dawn, a princess much more willing to work with the Iron Throne than attack it. Back in King's Landing, King Jaehaerys and his sons received a riotous welcome. Even Aegon the Conqueror had never won a battle without losing a single man. 